In the last video, I left you with a cliffhanger. This is the adjourned position from game six of the candidates final match between Tigran Petrosian and Bobby Fischer. Uh, so they adjourned here. Uh, Fischer is about to collect that pawn on this side of the board and will be a pawn up for nothing. So Petrosian under massive pressure. So in these adjourned games in the old days, basically one player had to seal a move. So they would write their move down on the score sheet that would be put in an envelope and sealed and given to the arbiter. And then they would go off and the next day they would continue the game. But that move that was given in the envelope, the sealed move would have to be played on the board. And Petrosian sealed the move Knight E2. Now, we'll go on to look at that in a second. There was a fascinating possibility here that he didn't want to risk, knowing, probably knowing that Fischer would have you know, a knight to analyze the move, and that is f4. And many commentators have claimed that this would actually hold the game. So before we look at the, the actual game, I'd like to have a look at this. This is really fascinating stuff. It's an extraordinary move. Uh, basically, white wants to take here and then bring the knight to f3 and attack two pawns. So, Really, black has to take this pawn. Now, if e takes, and we can see the point of this, the knight, basically for the first time in this game, reaches a good square. And after black takes off that pawn, white will be able to exchange off all the pawns on the king's side. That bishop is absolutely useless. In combination with a rook, it's a very strong piece. But here, where well, you can see, it does nothing and white can just win pawns on the king side. It'll be a draw. So after f4, black has to take this way. But again, white manages to break through with the knight. Now, there are many ways to play this. You can push the g-pawn, you can play h6. But let's just have a look at what happens if black just recovers this pawn uh, or, or takes the pawn a6 and white takes here. Now it looks as though that white is doing you know so much damage you know about to take lots of pawns. It's not so clear actually this one. For a start this bishop gets back and can hold this pawn that's very important. And now we have a race across the board. Black's king has to race back to stop that pawn. Uh, but not only that, this knight is just out of play for the time being. So black's king wants to come across and take that knight, basically. But white can save the knight by using the rook's pawn as a decoy. Now, if bishop takes pawn, then the knight comes in and takes the e-pawn. That's a draw. So instead... Black has to move the king across the board, and now we have a race. So let's just see how this winds up. In fact, white can't win material here because black's king gets across to trap the, the knight in the corner. So, for example, if you promote, then that gets taken and the knight is trapped in the corner. The king arrives just in time with an easy win. But in this position, instead of promoting, the knight drops back. So at least by pushing that pawn, the knight has managed to escape. Okay, let's see. We reach, basically reach this position. Black can take that rook's pawn. Now, is this a draw? It looks as though white has the, the kind of perfect blockade here. Even though black is two pawns up, how do you shift the king and knight? In fact, I think this is a win. That black king will march up the h-file and basically get in like this and use, well, one of those pawns as a distraction and should be able to break through. Even if the king gets to f3, even if you switch the position of the king and knight, 
usually it's possible to threaten to come in along the first rank. I think it's a win for black. So I'm not sure whether f4 would actually hold the draw and yeah, it would have given Fisher the whole night to analyze that one out. So in the end, anyway, Petrosian sealed knight e2. Now what did Petrosian say about this? Well, he said after the game, I, re I returned to the hotel minus a pawn. With my seconds, I began examining the position. It seemed like a fortress. Well, if it's a fortress, I said to my aides, I'm going to bed. If you want to have another look at it, go ahead. But I couldn't fall asleep. No more than an hour later, I got up, sat down at the board and couldn't see anything like a fortress. I kept analysing the position until morning. In some cases, I would manage to hold my ground. In other cases, I wouldn't. I couldn't see my way to a clear draw, but nor did I see a clear loss. When my seconds came, they soon agreed with me that no impregnable fortress was possible. So there you go, Petrosian analysed the whole night and still couldn't come to a definite conclusion about this position. So let's see what happened. Oh, he just must have been exhausted. So the bishop is attacked. Returns to a5. Black... Uh, is about to take the pawn. Obviously, Petrosian makes the best of it and pushes the king to the side, and you can see the king is trapped on the b-file. So how exactly does black break this position? I mean, it looks, looks so difficult for black. Well, yes, the king is very poor here on the a-file, but actually, the king and the knight also are really restricted. If that knight on e2 moves, then the rook will break in straight away with rook c3. The king hasn't got a move. So, in fact, white is restricted too. Now, this is a curious moment. Um, Petrosian said afterwards, before leaving for the session of play, I agreed to play f2, f3. That is, he agreed with his seconds. I agreed to play f3 in this position. Although during my nighttime analysis, I had definitely established that this very move should not be made. So the blame for the outcome of the game after the adjournment is only my own. I played terribly and actually lost without having to put up and actually lost without having to put up a real fight. Well, that, I mean, that's a very kind of confused statement in itself. So basically, he'd analysed one thing, his seconds had analysed another, they came to different conclusions, and when it came to the game, Petrosian was just in two minds. Now, he didn't need to play f3. Whether this would have made a difference to the result of the game, I'm not sure. I don't think it makes that much of a difference. He could have played rook b1. If bishop takes pawn, then rook comes to f1, uh, and then you take the pawn on f6. So black doesn't want to do that. So in this position, the bishop would have come back to a5, and Fisher would have to reset and start again. I think Petrosian's problem was that after f3, it weakens the e3 square. Um, and in some cases, you know, when black's rook breaks through, that is significant. But whether it would make, would have made a, a big difference to the game, I don't know. So anyway, f3 played. King a5. So now we start to see Fisher's plan. He's just encroaching up the board with his king, and he's basically squeezing that rook. Let's see what happens if... White's rook makes a break for it and heads up the other side of the board, rook b8. Then bishop b4. So this shuts out White's rook from the defence. Okay, let's play some a few random moves and see what Black's plan is. So basically, Black's king goes the other side of the bishop. And then the rook comes into c2 
and threatens rook d2 mate. Now that is the end of the line for white. So that is Fisher's idea. He's combining king, rook and bishop beautifully. Typical Fisher, of course, loves to play with rook and bishop. So Petrosian is actually really restricted here, and that is a threat to squeeze with the king and to push that rook out of the way. So rook c2 played by Petrosian. Now, if rook takes, then that should be a draw, then white has a blockade. So the rook moves to the side. And a check. And a check again, and the bishop blocks. And the rook goes back to a2. So Petrosian is basically just keeping the king locked out for the moment. And rook c7, so that covers c1 square, preventing the knight moving. And yeah, in any case, if the knight moves to g3, for example, then the rook would come in on c3. So you can see white is really restricted here. Petrosian waits. And Fisher waits for the moment. And here is where Petrosian kind of cracks. It's really strange. He makes a break with the rook to the other side of the board and suffers the consequences because his rook is going to be locked out. We'll see what happened in the game in a second. So the question is, what would happen if Petrosian had just waited with rook a2? Can black break through? Well, let's see a possible idea. Okay, rook c7 covers the seventh rank. White waits. And now bishop e7. So the idea is to move in with the king and slowly squeeze that rook out, basically. So here, and king b3 is threatened. So we'll give a check. And the king has to go back to the A file. But there is potentially a way through. But this, this position is actually a kind of Zugzwang here. The king can't move, the knight can't move, and so you can see that the king will move forward and then the rook is the basically the only piece that can move and that gets squeezed out of the way and black's king will come in. So rook c1, the rook waits, and now the bishop makes room for the rook to come in. And now this is looking really serious for white. It's still not over actually. Um, but let's, again, let's see a, a possible scenario if rook c8 The rook comes in. Now you've got to be really careful. You can't can't just take there because of rook a8 mate. So we have to check the uh, the king back, and then come in with the king. So the king does manage to to get through. But now well, the problem is we need to get the rook into the position. So we play rook a4. So we're going to play the bishop there, and then the rook will come in. It's really delicate. And here, well, finally, it looks like black is breaking through, basically. And that should be winning. But you can see how tricky it is. And I love the way the king and the bishop kind of just shift around each other, making room, covering checks, and finally the, the rook breaks through. So it's probably winning, but very delicate. But instead of waiting, Petrosian played the rook to a7. And now some beautiful steps by Fischer to win the game. So first of all, bishop a5, and the rook is shut out from the defence. But Petrosian is making life difficult. Again, another beautiful move from Fischer. Bishop b6, preventing the rook coming back to the a-file, and blocking out the rook here, covering the king. Knight c1, take care. Knight wants to activate, but king a4, very good move. 
and now bishop b4 opens up the c file for the rook and of course if necessary that bishop can cover on the a file so the knight moves back and now that allows the king in and so the threat well we've seen previously what the threat is the rook wants to come down here whoops or even even here that's better and give checkmate on d2 so that prevents rook c2 because of course if rook c2 then this rook takes bishop followed by king takes rook so rook a8 we're still not quite there but now the rook wants to come in down on one of these squares and here if knight c1 heading into a rook and pawn end game then this is winning so the threat is to play rook a3 and if rook b3 actually this is a really cute zugzwang position so after h6 basically white hasn't got a good move here you can play the king up but then king c2 and that pawn is going to go through or if rook b6 well you can see the rook is squeezed if rook b6 then give a check and d3 and the pawn goes home again okay back to this position so rook a8 just played Trojan took on h7 and now it's breakthrough time threatening rook d1 and mate so basically Petrosian had to give up the knight and Fischer's technique was impeccable he checked the king back and basically white's king is now caught in a mating net and it's very impressive once again to see how Fischer is using the king and bishop beautifully the bishop shields the king and here we go, the king moves in. Here, Petrosian resigned. Well, mate is threatened, and if the king shuffles across, then the king follows and picks up this pawn, and, well, it's going to be checkmate very, very soon. What a superb endgame from Fischer. Really, really impressive technique. Um, later on... Fischer said that this was the moment in the match when he felt that Petrosian cracked. In fact, there's a fascinating interview with Fischer on the Dick Cavett show. Dick Cavett, a famous talk show host in the 1960s and 1970s in the States. And, well, check out that video on YouTube. It's really fascinating. Um, Fischer said, After the sixth game, I felt him crumbling at that stage. He came into the game looking a little bit mousy. I took it from there. Well, it's true, you know. Petrosian's play in the opening was not great in this game and Fischer really outplayed him but superb stuff um, I'll give you more games from this match coming up soon I hope you enjoyed that thanks for watching